Aliens vs. Yokai. A battle as old as time in the world of Dandadan. These spirit guardians protect Earth from alien invasion, but even then it seemed that on one fateful day the planet was destined to be destroyed. That's because as you'll see in this video, you do not want to mess with aliens. From our very own ancestors, a being so all-knowing and all-powerful it's considered a miracle to even lay eyes on him, to a race of intergalactic mercenaries that stop at nothing to ensure complete and utter domination of space. This is every alien in Dandadan. It's assumed there's approximately 666 species in our galaxy, starting with the Saponians, who are an entirely male race from the planet, well, Serpo. At Nagi Hospital, the Saponians encountered Momo Ayase and forcibly abducted her to extract her reproductive organs. Before they could begin their procedure, a possessed Okoron unexpectedly appeared out of Momo's phone and attacked the aliens, although they managed to subdue him with their psychic powers, and so the Serpos proceeded on Momo. However, after overstimulating her brainwaves, they accidentally unlocked her psychic powers as well. Thus, she destroys their ship and defeats the aliens. Now, whilst they only played a minor role here, they later Later turned out to be an integral part of the story. The Saponians have for a very long time been overseeing Earth, but before interacting with humans, they took their time to study their behaviour, language and history. Their knowledge extends so far even beyond the solar system, where it's according to their data that there's at least 666 aliens in Earth's galactic system. The Serpos also hold information about Earth's deep historical knowledge that even the humans aren't aware of, like historical tombs from the pyramids to the coast and burial mounds, which are actually transmission systems utilised for spatial travel. Their intensive intel stems from the advanced technology the Saponians developed. Being incredibly intelligent, possessing high level skills in science, they crafted UFOs which can turn invisible to travel undetected. They also have devices that can cast the empty space, allowing them to interact with humans without interference or exposure to the outside world. These advancements are literally how their race survives, as by only using cloning technology the Serpos can reproduce. Produce. However, after some time, they realised that their planet faced a detrimental problem because of this method. When every individual is identical, evolution and growth of the species does not occur. As a result, conflict and emotions such as joy, anger, grief and pleasure cease to exist. This though being beneficial for objective purposes and streamlined progress, in the end the lack of creativity and enjoyment of life halts their race from moving forwards. Hence to tackle this, the Serpos decided to pay a visit to Earth. Earth, where humankind's form of reproduction was the answer to their problem. Using alien technology, the Serpos created humanoid skins to wear so that they could infiltrate without being noticed. Well, kinda. It could do with a bit of work. What? Now unlike the humans, the Serpos had cloned themselves with technological robotic appendages which they never used in the same way that uh, you or I did. To gain some experience, the Saponians needed to insert their pee, pee into a female organ, later extracting their womb, all to understand its working out and how their race can reacquire reproductive functions. Likewise, they also need a male appendage which they refer to as a banana. However, none of the Serpos like men, so they kind of skip this step. Well, kinda. However, their robot PP is no joke. And that sounds crazy after those words just came out of my mouth. But no, seriously. Not only can they extract wounds, but they can also turn into scissors to snip the banana organs as they please. It can also be used to increase the power of other aliens by injecting special chemicals. Now, it's not really clear if it's coming from the same appendage, but what's certain is that there is multiple Swiss Army knife-like systems inside of the Serpos, where another tool located in their chest can be used to inject others healing them from even fatal injuries, but this can only be utilised once, costing the Serpos their life. But to make them even more OP, their PP can turn into cables which confuse the Serpos bodies with one or more life forms. The life form they combine with then adopts the Serpos natural and real appearance, which is a stripy body like this. A cool thing to note is that their body structure bears a strong resemblance to the Dada race seen in the Ultraman series. Even their attack form is reminiscent of an Ultra Beam. Moreover, the name Serpo is widely recognised in UFOlogy, concerning extraterrestrial entities often linked to government projects or as the supposed homeworld of an alien race. Regardless as a being itself, they possess psychic powers allowing them to manipulate objects, people and manipulate brainwaves to arouse abducted humans, helping them 
get ready for, you know, yeah. One of their techniques, Six Root, sends out shockwaves strong enough to create craters on walls, but using the Serpa formula surveying method, they can unleash an even stronger variant of it. This was described by Ira as being hit by an invisible wall. Additionally, when three Serpos are together, they can combine their psychokinetic powers to create a pressurized field known as the Awesome Zone, capable of nullifying and subduing a human with yokai powers as well. In fact, had it not been for Momo's interference, Ira and Ocarun would have been done for. That being said, not all Serpos are bad, which is where best boy Rokuro comes in. When they and the gang encounter a common enemy, Rokuro joins forces with Momo to later even have a friendly relationship with her. Though his actions can be seen as very objective, as he needed ISA and her powers to defeat the Kerr, with the primary goal of deleting the valuable data they had stolen, his actions showcased a route that could lead to evolving emotions. When presented with the perfect opportunity to abduct Momo, Rokuro decided to send away all his clones and form a truce with her for helping him out in battle. He even planned to use his healing injection on her when the time was right, but ended up using it on Momo's friend instead. However, the Serpos, despite trying to blend in and act friendly often do the opposite, acting violently towards the humans they abduct. Likewise, they're quick to lose patience with other aliens that they have on their books. You see, they hire other life forms to help them achieve their goal, one of which being the Flatwoods monster. In fact, this was the second alien Momo and Ocarun had the luxury of encountering. It was first spotted in the town of Flatwoods in Baxton County, West Virginia, which is where it got the name. However, at some point, it migrated to Japan and roamed the Yamanashi prefecture. After managing to survive the Turbo Granny and Serpo attack, Momo took Okurun home, hoping to finally relax. But in order to get Okurun inside safely, she had to take down the charm that was protecting her home from evil spirits. Bad move. Because of this, the Flatwood monster could get in, intent on stealing both Okurun and Momo's genitals for the Serpos. This, however, proves something interesting. That aliens and yokai aren't all that different. Studies show that people who see psychic phenomena often all also see UFOs just as frequently, implying that yokai and aliens share a form of commonality with each other despite their intense rivalry. Nonetheless, in order to stop the Flatwoods monster rampage, Momo helps Okurun tap into the Turbo Granny's powers properly for the first time, allowing him to cut off some of its limbs. This was huge because the secret to defeating the Flatwoods monster is sumo. When its hand is forced to touch the ground, it will begin to disintegrate. In spite of this, the alien isn't opposed to dabbling in some cheating here there, as it could sprout new legs from its neck to keep upright. Thus, Momo was forced to think outside the box, literally. She allowed herself to get plummeted into a thick wall the alien had created to keep them trapped so that a deep enough hole to hold both her and Okurun could be made. From there, she reapplied the talisman, ultimately turning the Flatwoods monster to ash. But it being defeated didn't stop the Serpos from once again trying to achieve their objective, and so they hired the Dover Demon from the alien race. Now, the Dover Demon refers to an unexplained creature speculated to be either an alien or an extra-dimensional entity sighted by multiple people in Dover, Massachusetts in 1977. In the Serpo arc, one named Peeny Weenie, aka Mr. Mantis Shrimp, was hired as a fighter to capture Ocarun. So along with the cryptid Nessie and three other Serpos, they attacked Ocarun and ISA whilst they were still at school. However, they encounter unexpected interference from Ira Shiratori, a spiritually unaware girl who would not so earlier awakened the power to use a spirit's abilities, much like Okurun. The Serpo have the Dover Demon fight back against her, but Momo arrives and uses her psychokinesis to repel theirs, allowing her friends to regain mobility. In an attempt to get the upper hand, the Serpos inject Mr. Mantis Shrimp with some special energy serum to forcefully transform him into the Dover Demon Strong Style 24. This turned him from a crab to a Mantis Shrimp, increasing his physical prowess. Ironically though, despite a Mantis Shrimp's strength being increased under water, this form didn't have gills, meaning he had to come up for air. An interesting fact is that this enhanced form bears a striking resemblance to Alien Baltan from the Ultraman series. Now regarding when Nessie unexpectedly turns against them, attacking the Serpo leaving only one alive, he uses his amalgamation cables to merge Nessie and the Dover Demon, creating the Serpod Dover Demon Nessie. Hence this fused being begins to assault with high compression water blasts from its mouth, but soon runs out of water after the trio evades the beams and targets the neck, ultimately destroying this completely 
combined entity. Nonetheless, this would mark the beginning of their great relationship, as Mr. Mantis Shrimp apologises and evolved into the most helpful alien in the series. You see, the whole reason Mr. Mantis Shrimp even worked with the Serpos was to earn enough money for his son, Chiquitita's treatment, who suffered from an illness which had killed his mother. Luckily, Granny Seiko came to the rescue. Because the Dover Demon's blood is milk, she gives them a cow to make the child's blood transfusion cheaper and easier. In spite of this, the family is forced to move to Earth permanently as they soon learn that cows aren't quite cut out for living on other planets. And so, by using a spaceship given to him by a friend, who we'll get on to soon, Peeny Weenie was stationed on Earth disguised as a human and started work as a farmer. From then on, Mr. Mantis Shrimp vowed to never harm humans and made it a point to assist them during crises, often putting his own life on the line. But although he's willing to fight for noble causes, Mr. Mantis Shrimp considers himself a pacifist. He refused to teach Ocarun how to fight, believing violence was wrong, though he admits he can be defensive, especially when criticised for his driving skills. However, Mr. Mantis Shrimp's race is renowned for their incredibly durable bodies and immense strength, making them formidable combatants suitable for roles as bodyguards. They're even immune to venom and some other poisons. But Mr. Mantis Shrimp was considered weak amongst his kind and criticised by the Serpos for underperforming in battle. This only gives us an insight into how truly broken their race might be, since he himself is insanely powerful. He's capable of delivering devastating punches that can break through walls and send opponents flying with ease, which makes him formidable in close combat. In fact, with his trademark jet punch when used at full strength, he can quickly incapacitate anyone. In his transformed state, Mr. Mantis Shrimp gains a huge boost for 24 seconds, or 24 hours with the Serpo energy jizz. This transformation enhances his strength 24 times stronger and 10 times greater in water, where with his math, it makes him 240 times more powerful. He showcases this insane strength when he one-shots a member of the Kerr, which is crazy because the Kerr are an intergalactic band of merciless aliens that will not stop until they have conquered all planets. But more on that in just a moment, as first we have the invasion of the Mandrel alien bro. This 300 IQ genius came to Earth searching for test subjects when he stumbled upon Momo at her school. This primate held a staff which he could use to hit cans at his opponent at frightening speeds capable of damaging the school building. That's just the start though, as he even developed the Territory Can. It covers a 100 kilometer radius where it can turn those that touch it into a walking tin can and then the people that touch that also become a can and so on and so forth, until all humans in the area are cans. Yokai powers are also useless in this territory, as Ocarun couldn't enter his Turbo Granny form. In spite of this, the Mandrel alien has a big weakness. His own brain. His 300 IQ, or should I say, 3 million IQ can easily be manipulated by taunting him about how stupid bro is, which Momo used against him, forcing him to launch cans at the support pillar holding up the roof beneath the territory can, causing it to collapse and break. This meant Ocarun could finally transform and land the finishing blow. Unfortunately though, that was the final time an alien invasion could be deterred that easily, bringing us onto one of the most terrifying and dangerous species of them all. The Kerr. This name was given to them by the Serpos when they were attacked and defeated by them after being ultimately led to Earth. As a result, this globalist military unit gained access to all of the Serpos' vast knowledge of planets and languages. Now, whilst they may look like a mix-matched group of creatures, under their suits they're a bunch of octopus-like aliens just like H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu. Because they've conquered so many planets, their technology has reached unbelievable heights, such as instant teleportation portals. Despite being a globalist race of criminals though, they can't survive on other worlds without special exosuits due to the atmosphere. As a result, the Kerr captured and tamed giant aliens known as Big Mamas. These creatures are seemingly mindless and seek solely to consume, and that's where their importance comes in, because they eat people and then shit out the perfect exosuit, the very same that the Kerr used to survive on other planets. Thus, they show no mercy to other species, as in their eyes, the life forms on other planets that they conquer are just materials to make powerful suits that they can use in battle. Furthermore, the more powerful the original alien, the better the exosuit created creating their advanced unit. On top of that, the Kerr also make use of anything the lifeforms leave behind if it's useful to them. Sometimes they'll even enslave creatures to do their dirty work, like how they changed the Serpos to act as their minions against Momo. This was an act of the Imo 
Otaku Ko, whose suit gave it a pocket dimension which it could operate from. This keeps the wearer safe from any physical attacks, making them untouchable to anything outside. Just think of uh, Toby from Naruto. What's wild is that they can still interact with the real world, giving them an unfair edge in battle by allowing them to strike from safety. Even if an opponent has powers that can cross dimensions like Momo, they can't force the wearer out of this space. Having the ability to manipulate space, they can also bring others into a makeshift dimension like it did with Momo while she was working at the maid cafe. By doing so, they have control over the data transference that they bring along. In an instance, the Kerr managed to steal some of the Serpos and altered their data and physiology during the cloning process. This gave them makeshift minions. But when the Serpo Rockero utilized his iron technology to rewrite them back to factory settings, the Imataku suit allowed the Kerr to shoot out tendrils to rewrite any changes made in the empty space it created. On top of this, with these sharp, extendable, whip-like limbs, they can attack and pierce their targets. That being said, once Mama remembered her granny's words about using the power of words to make the impossible possible, she was able to use her Moe Moe tribeam to one-shot the Imotoko. However, this is merely just one of the many aliens the Kerr have forcefully turned into exosuits. For example, in the world of Dandadan, it would seem that the Xenomorph well and truly exists in a faraway world, as the Jet Booster exosuit is clearly based on one. However, the biomechanical spines of a Xeno have since been swapped out for jets which can help the Kerr reach extremely high speeds, which goes perfectly in hand with the wielder's incredible close quarters combat skills to the point where the increased force of punches can create crates in the ground. In fact, this could even go up against Ocarun in his Turbo Granny form, sending him flying with a single punch. However, once Ocarun unlocked his ability to traverse through telephone wires and reach near light speed, he managed to destroy the jet booster with a single attack. This isn't the only xenomorph looking curse suit though, as there's also the head exosuit. The difference here though is that this one could fly and shoot fire bullets in an opponent before Ocarun eventually destroyed it. But this is where the Kerr begin to really level up. I'm talking about the Hatser. I mean, what else do you expect from a suit named after a literal Lovecraftian god? This suit grants the user the abilities to carve out space as its main form of combat. That's right, its ability is literally... <laughs> By thrusting their palm, they can send the distortion of space that destroys anything in its path, along with crushing their targets by squeezing the space around them. This was so powerful that Ocarun was put on life support. This suit doesn't just have an insane offensive ability though, but also makes the wearer near untouchable. It does this by carving out space to pull others in close or further away. This carved out space can then be turned into an almost impenetrable shield, which even withstood Ocarun's all-out headbutt. Further more, they can even send things into the suit's pocket dimension located on its back. This extends to even living people, where once inside you're kept alive but trapped forever unless the user lets you out. This ability to call upon the things inside the pocket dimension can be used in battle, as seen when the Kerr redirected a wave of debris back at Momo after she used it against them. As if that wasn't enough, the end of the suit's tail is equipped with a shank that can pierce you with ease. Now, you may think, how can you possibly beat this thing without putting yourself in danger. You don't. You see, it was merely thanks to the pure genius from Momo as she allowed herself to be absorbed to then unleash psychic attacks from within the pocket dimension, destroying the suit. From carving out space to anti-gravity though now, as another species the Kerr turned into exosuits was the Takomeshi. Standing at a towering 3 meters tall, this behemoth hovers effortlessly thanks to its jet propulsion. Equipped with six mechanical arms wielding blunt weapons, it can unleash relentless assaults making evasion nearly impossible. In close quarters combat, the Takameshi generates a shockwave field around it, inflicting intense internal pain on living targets, often leaving them immobilized, coughing up blood. This also devastates any inorganic matter in its vicinity. Whilst resilient opponents may withstand the effects, key-based attacks can bypass the field entirely. Gigi, for instance, dented it with his Ha Wave and later breached it with his evil gun. But next comes the anti-gravity cannon, which can obliterate anything in its path. At point blank range and even downed with the formidable evil eye showcasing its power. This beam can also match other powerful energy blasts and even overpower them when combined with another attack. For example, when it teamed up with the Sudoku's electromagnetic projectile, it easily overwhelmed the Gigi's evil gun. In fact, the only way to overcome the Takameshi's anti-gravity beam is by hitting it with an even stronger energy blast, as seen when Gigi unlocked his spiraling evil gun unleashing his most powerful attack. But talking to the Sudoku, don't let him fool you. 
here. He may look like a cute little guy, but he's actually a master marksman. This suit's railgun can shoot an electromagnetic projectile at its target, which is powerful enough to damage the ground and even knock Ira in her acrobatic silky form a long distance away. Its skills aren't limited to just long distances though, as the Sudoku's exosuit gives the wearer excellent flying ability, making it the most mobile exosuit of them all. In spite of this, the rifle wasn't strong enough to even graze the evil eye, who hit it with an Una reverse card, destroying the suit with ease. One of the more multi-purpose curse suits, however, are born from a race of alien praying mantises. Not just any though, as this suit comes with laser blades. That being said, whilst very powerful, this is merely one form of this exosuit, as it can even enter its underwater mode, a version which vastly increases its overall strength by 100 times. In this form, it swaps the laser blades for more power and speed in its legs, which is strong enough to crack the seabed. And if that wasn't enough, they're also equipped with a venomous stinger, which is capable of dissolving the target's internal organs for them to then slurp up. In spite of this, the Mantis Curse ended up fighting the worst possible opponent, Peeny Weenie. As when he shapeshifted, the Kerr was given the left-right goodnight and destroyed. The Takanoko Rupatro, on the other hand, is another huge 3-meter alien suit capable of widespread destruction. Its 360-degree rotating head, paired with its advanced heads-up display, gives it near-total vision, helping the Kerr to track their targets with ease. While its tough shell can endure powerful attacks from even yokai enhanced humans like Ira's acrobatic Silky, the suit's primary weapon is a barrage of guided missiles strong enough to severely injure her and knock her unconscious. However, the explosions are a double-edged sword as they produce thick smoke that hinders the suit's hood. That's not all though, as the Takanoko Rupacho also has floating discs that emit electricity to form a shield. This barrier makes close quarters combat dangerous, as it has a built-in Uno reverse, where each attack is countered with an electric shock, something Ocarin's second wife, Vamola, learned painfully. However, the brains in Ira were just too powerful, as she cleverly used her non-conductive silky hair to bypass the electric shield, ultimately defeating the suit. Bringing us onto the Takoasa, another powerful suit with six three meter long mechanical limbs that caused chaos for Okran and the group during the Kerr invasion. Their limbs are perfect for binding targets, leading them wide open for attacks with claws powerful enough to cause intense pain. The real danger though comes from the Takoasa's true ability, which is that when it sinks its fingers into an enemy's body, it can absorb the living being's energy for themselves. The target is then reduced to nothing more than an empty shell. That being said, there is a limit to how much energy the exosuit can absorb. If too much energy is drained from a being with massive reserves, the suit will overheat and eventually explode. Similar to the pain that absorbed Naruto's sage energy, the Takawasa can be trapped into doing the same, as once the fingers are inserted, the absorption can't be stopped until they are pulled out, something Gigi took advantage of. Talking of violent explosions though, the Takoshin Joe is another Kerr capable of causing chaos. Standing at 4 meters, it's one of the biggest suits in the Kerr arsenal. Thus it's armed with crazy heavy weaponry such as rocket launchers and gatling guns. That being said, it can all prove useless in the face of someone with good defenses or incredible speed and reflexes. For example, Okarun in his turbo granny form was able to dodge every rocket fired at him no problem. Now this all seems like a lot, but it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the true power of the Kerr army. After succeeding in getting some of their giant UFOs through a portal powered by Ocarun's golden testicle, it became clear how big of a problem these guys are. In fact, Earth was destined to be done for had it not been for the interference of the planet's strongest yokai, Reiko Kashimo, trapping them all in a mirror with her power. In spite of this, the Kerr aren't opposed to allying themselves with other powerful beings such as Count Saint Germain, who's going around collecting different powers in his quest for Dandadan. But again, more on him in just a bit. However, the terror of the Kerr does not end yet, as a lot of their army are still stationed in other planet colonies, such as on Summer, which gave birth to the most powerful exosuit to exist. Godzilla. And this is also where we learn that the look of the suit created by the Big Mama isn't just to do with the original species' own appearance, as they can also take the shape of something that's incredibly important to that world's home species. Because of this, this suit resembles the God of Summer. But before the Kerrs made the Sumerians planet a galactic outpost, its people flourished and evolved from Earth. Well, currently, that's at least a heavy implication, with the Sumerians being the ancestors of the human race, looking almost identical 
identical to the Earthlings, except for the little antennas on their heads. You see, a long time ago, they migrated from Earth, which they call Idea. In the real world, the Sumerians are in fact one of the oldest civilizations known to man, originating from Mesopotamia. However, in the world of Dandadan, these people either had developed so much or had been blessed by aliens to gain advanced technology. One in particular being warp gates, which are disguised as the burial grounds throughout Earth. Although this migration was considered a myth, the royal Sumerian family guarded Summer's warp gate in their place for thousands of years. Having one already present in their new planet though indicates alien intervention that facilitated this species migration. Likely, Earth was going through turmoil in which the human race needed to escape. This danger was more than likely the very god the people of Summer worship, and we can deduce this based off the carvings on the walls. This fire-breathing kaiju, likely a cryptid, is being attacked by humans with both sticks and arrows. The Sumerians who migrated over to the new planet had recorded what happened on these walls, but after thousands of years, these carvings have begun to be misunderstood, giving worship to their god rather than fear. They believed that it would save their race from extinction, whereas in reality, it could very well be the opposite. Nonetheless, they made it their tradition to pray to it at the end of every day. Eventually, the Sumerians possessed advanced weaponry such as laser guns and wore protective combat gear on the battlefield. Furthermore, their planet's warp gate was programmed to be used only by a Sumerian. At some point though, planet Summer was invaded by the Kerr. Despite their efforts, the Sumerians were overpowered, with many males killed or enslaved to become exosuits for the Kerr's big mama. During this invasion, an exosuit resembling their god was created from the essence of a few female Sumerians. Banga, who was a non-believer in the myth, saw this suit as the embodiment of Sumerian hate, and later stole it to liberate the enslaved males and fight back against the Kerr aliens. But her main purpose was to get the Mola, Summer's sole known surviving child, to the warp gate so that she could live out her years, continuing their race on a new planet. Unfortunately, the warp gate lacked enough power for more than one person, you know, because they didn't have Ocarin's OP golden testicle just yet, and so Banga stayed behind whilst she sent her adopted daughter alone. But of course with the stolen Gojira suit. However, the Kerr invaded Sumeria to get access to their warp gate, but couldn't work it out until seeing Banga use it. So to retrieve their Godzilla suit and colonize Earth just as they did to Summer, the Kerr used their technology and torture tactics to send their forces over to Earth. Once they obtained the Ocker and Golden Testy, they had the energy to send the whole army. However, as we mentioned, their invasion was thwarted. With most of the Kerr ships and personnel trapped in the Mirror Realm, Banga, her friends and some male Sumerians acquired a spacecraft to fight the remaining ones off as they headed to Earth to reunite with Vimola, who had successfully made it to Earth, and found a strong man in Ocarun at which Banga ordered her to get married and make babies. But after being rejected, Vimola was a key player in stopping the Kerr invasion on Earth, as by using Godzilla, she was able to fight and even destroy some of the Kerr in their exosuits. Like the Takanaka Rupacho, the Mola suit analyzes the environment with a heads-up display. Furthermore, this suit comes with immense strength, where a single punch is powerful enough to overpower humans with yokai abilities. But that's about the only similarity it has with the other suits, as with the Mola's, it can go full-on kaiju size. In fact, the size varies depending on how big the suit wearer wants it to be. Thus, it's no surprise that the defensive capabilities are next level. It withstood a full force charging attack from Ocarun, that is nothing compared to its most powerful version. But first, despite these intense hits, the only damage the suit sustained was a broken horn, with it continuing to function perfectly. Additionally, Vimola, the pilot, showed no signs of injury after ejecting from the suit. But that's not all this kaiju is capable of, as it can even go completely invisible. However, it is not without its flaws. In one case, the suit's invisibility exposed its golden core, making it appear as though the opponent was fighting a floating ball. Additionally, the suit's presence can be revealed if covered by something, like when Ira used her acrobatic silky hair to wrap around and expose it. On the topic of being covered by something though, this suit can double up as clothing by replicating whatever the user wants it to through the power of anime schoolgirl magic. But nothing, absolutely nothing, comes close to this suit's slaughter mode. As you'd expect, this is when the suit is at its peak. Larger and 
stronger than ever before. Furthermore, it's armed with a ferocious horn capable of generating electricity. After Vermola lost control due to an invading Kerr in her suit, it took Kinta piloting the great Kinta Buddha Vista, smacking it with the Tokyo Tower, which had literally zero effect. Thus, Vermola's new boyfriend Kinta was left with no choice but to use the suit's overwhelming size to its advantage by using Ludris's nano skin to create a jetpack that lifted it into the sky before using gravity against it, spiraling towards the ground at high speeds with a power pump. Something which ultimately deactivated the suit's slaughter mode, damaging the Kerr inside who had to evacuate. In spite of all this, even the Serpos themselves know that this is merely the beginning of the Kerr's terror, with their return marking a likely full-on war between yokai and alien. But the strongest battle suit by far was not something birthed by a big mama, and neither did it belong to the Kerr. Rather, it was made by Vermola's human lover, Kinta, who, with the most advanced alien technology on this list, made a Gundam. This technology is, of course, none other than the ultra-high density nanomachines, aka the Shape Memory Alloy Nanoskin. It's super overpowered because, with just imagination alone, it can be molded into anything. It does this by picking up the electrical signals from the person's brain and takes on the form that they are picturing. Kinta mid-battle was able to manipulate it into a bike, to a plane, and then the biggest mech known to mankind. Even if the object created is broken or damaged, the nanoskin can restore itself back to normal. Now this insane piece of technology belongs to the next alien on our list. Ludris. He was first introduced in Chapter 62 when Mr. Mantis Shrimp requests his help to reconstruct the ISA family home after it was destroyed. Peeny Weenie says that Ludris is a construction specialist and of course with his nano skin they rebuild everything in no time. Later in Chapter 90 we learn that this is who Mr. Mantis Shrimp's spaceship actually belongs to, where the then Serpo Rokuro shows his shock at even hearing his name. He reveals that Ludris is actually an all-knowing and all-powerful being, and because he flies through throughout space, it's considered a miracle to even encounter him once. But from his appearance alone, we can deduce more secrets about his character. Because whilst it's obvious he's got a body that's totally made up of blocks and shapes, there's a very important shape here, and that is the triangle. It's an upside down one in the middle of his body with a Rinnegan eye pattern inside of it. Because of this imagery, there's the idea that Ludris or his race was responsible for creating the pyramids and the great burial grounds around Earth, aka the points of galactic travel. which makes Makes sense as he travels all across space. And because of this, it's even possible that he was the one that helped the Sumerian ancestors relocate to their new planet many, many years ago. This pyramid and its eye even refer back to our world, relating to the Illuminati and the secret society, to even the foundation of the Western world, where this symbolism is referred to as the Eye of Providence, or the All Seeing Eye, representing God watching over mankind at all times. But in Dandadan, this symbol is reversed, and later we even even find it on the collar of Count San Germain. Though it's not confirmed whether or not he's an alien, we know that he's lived a very long time to the point of being hated by Turbo Granny, who dubbed him the Hyper Geezer. From the memories of the Kerr that were obtained by the Serpos, we know he visited their home planet and worked alongside them. We can conclude that it's their planet based on the fact that they are not in the exosuits which protect them from other planets' hostile atmosphere. Germain later revisits Earth, entering from the gates of hell. This is a sculpture crafted by the French artist Auguste Rodin, who was commissioned to create a portal for Paris's planned Museum of Decorated Arts. Although the museum was never built, Rodin worked throughout his life on the Gates of Hell, a monumental sculpture group depicting scenes from Dante's Inferno in high relief. Several casts of the work were made, which are now in various locations around the world. Thus, I wouldn't be surprised that if in Dandadan, these sculptures are in fact embedded with special alien technology that is utilised by Saint Germain, allowing them to portal around the universe to collect every piece of the paranormal. Ludris' reversed eye being on his collar also heavily implies that they may be connected in some way. Now, when it comes to powers, Germain's ability to collect or steal abilities is pretty insane, as we even saw him perform memory manipulation as he was able to make himself deputy head teacher at Momo and Okaran's school, with all the other teachers not having any recollection.
recollection of him, yet all accepting that he does belong there. The way that Senjaman achieves this power to steal abilities is by forcing someone or something into admitting defeat. For example, he made a deal with the fairy tale card yokai to help him out of a cursed box. In return, the yokai wielded, allowing Jaman to stab him with a small knife and take their powers, which would then theoretically allow him to corrupt the mind of others by forcing them to face their inner trauma when looking into his eyes. Furthermore, it means he can raise multiple body parts from your head, such as your nose, mouth, ears and eyes. The question remains though, what is this dandadan that he searches for? Well, whilst we wait and find out, maybe click this video on your screen right now to enjoy some more peak fiction.